Hello. Hi. And welcome to our IELTS session. I'm here with Emma, our IELTS expert, and we're going to be talking about part three of the speaking test. Now, you may have seen our previous live sessions where we talked about part one yes. and part two. So, Emma, can you give us an overview of what part three is? Okay, so part three of the test, it comes after part one where you've had your questions and answers, part two where you've given your presentation, and then part three will be linked by theme to mm -hmm. part two, but it's a more in-depth discussion with the examiner. So it focuses on your ability to express and justify opinions, mm -hmm. to analyze, discuss, and speculate about issues. Okay, so I think we've got that on the slide. Yes, yeah. we do have that on the slide, but I thought we'll wait a little bit more for okay. um, more people to join us. And if you've only just joined us, we I'm here with Emma, who is our IELTS expert, and we are talking about part three of the speaking test. And she's just given an overview of what part three is, which I'm gonna now show on a slide here. Um, so. so yeah, the examiner will ask questions, mm -hmm. um, but they may also join in with the discussion. So it's a more natural, high level discussion, more in depth, um, often about more abstract topics. Yeah. So not about your life, where you live, that kind of thing, more, um, just much broader topics yeah. okay okay um and of course uh we as part of this session we're also gonna do like a role play and so yeah i'm gonna be a candidate and um we'll we'll properly demonstrate what that means yes so but um we're going to take a slightly different approach than the last two in the last two videos sj has given um a less good example mm -hmm and an excellent example, and we've analyzed the difference between the two. Um, today, we're just going to give you um, a lot of information on how to approach part three, and then SJ is, as always, is going to be our role play candidate, and she's going to just give us a good example. Okay? Now, for those of you who haven't seen us before, I am actually a native speaker, as, and Somewhere. I have to say that, um, even as I'm a native speaker, I do find these tests are, are quite are actually quite hard. I mean, it, it does require some thought. It does require focus mm -hmm. and, and do strategy need, and strategy. Mm -hmm. And you do need to actually think about what you're going to say. Um, and so it's not just off the cuff just because you can speak the language. Yeah. Um, anyway, so for those of you who are just joining us, this is a session on part three of the speaking test. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, and I'm here with Emma, who is our IELTS expert. Now, you may have seen that we put out a video previously on some true or false statements about yeah. what part three is all about, and we're going to address those statements now. So the first statement that we put out was, ooh, I'm sorry, I might have accidentally touched my mic there. The questions in part three are the same as part one. Is that true or false? Well, we already just said that it's not the same as part one. So part one is often about every more everyday topics and part three is about more abstract um, topics. So a more in-depth discussion. However, it is linked to part two. By theme, yes. By theme. Yeah. But as you will see later on, it is not that linked. It's not going to be a major follow-up, which no. surprised me <laughs> quite a bit as well. The second statement we put out was, you can't ask the examiner to repeat the question. True or false? Well, in part three, actually, you can ask the examiner for some help. So we're going to give you some really useful language that you can use if you find you're a little bit stuck in part three. OK, so hang in there. We will be giving you helpful language to use when you need a bit of help, a bit of clarification from the examiner. Third statement, you must give your own opinions in part three. Well, you have to give an opinion. <laughs> You get that staying quiet and not answering the questions is not an option. And we've raised this point uh, here because there is a question that we get we get asked quite a lot about opinions, which we will get to later on. And the fourth statement is, if you don't know what to say, just stay quiet. Again, like the previous answer, no, don't stay quiet. This is a speaking test. If you stay quiet, they can't give you any, any marks. So we need to... Um, get into the habit, we need lots of practice, we need to get into the habit of 
coming up with an answer, yes. even to a question that you think, oh my goodness, I have no idea. Yes. And finally, part three is a discussion. That's the last statement we put out, which we have been saying. Yes, it is it a is. discussion. So it might be a case that you do most of the speaking. After all, it is your, the, a test of your English. Mm. But in part three, the examiner might join in a little bit in a more of a discussion capacity. Okay. Okay. So let's get on to our first um, overview. Okay. Um, so the first. So what we'll do is we'll address some of the questions we get asked quite a lot. And one of the questions we get asked quite a lot is, well, actually, having something to say. I think that's, that's you know, would you say that's the yeah, that's question the one, yeah. that you get a lot? <laughs> yeah, so they often worry, my students often come to me and saying, I, I don't know what to say at all. I don't know if my opinion is, is right. I don't know if my ideas are right. So the important thing to remember is that you're not being tested on your ideas, on your opinions. You're being tested on your English. So your ability to deal with a difficult well-developed answer, to use um, the kind of language and grammar that's expected from you at that level, at that high, you know, if you're going for a high band score, then you need to be able to show that you can use cohesive devices and linkers and strategies appropriately in the same way that a, um, a high level speaker of English can. Um, you need to be able to develop your argument. So there is a lot of crossover with the writing test, with part two, when you're writing your essays and you're having to develop an argument, you have to make a decision about what you're going to write and you have to stay on topic. You have to develop an argument. You have to show the reader where you're going with your argument. Well, this is a kind of, it's like a mini spoken version of that. So you, all that language you've been learning to prepare for your writing test is going to be really helpful for you in your speaking test as well. Um, I just wanted to reiterate to those of you who are just joining us that there will be a question and answer uh, session after we've done our presentation. Yes. Yes. So hold on to your questions and have a think about what you want to ask us. Uh, and also, we'll be answering questions about the speaking test and particularly the part three of the speaking test. Mm. So we won't be able to answer any questions about the writing test or the listening test today, but watch out for future sessions where we'll be addressing yeah. those. Okay. So as to what Emma was talking about, which is how to develop your answers, we've got all her tips here. Okay, so yeah, we, this is a pro, an approach that I often give to mm -hmm. my students just to help them. It's very simple, mm -hmm. but it helps to them to produce a fully rounded, well-developed answer. So three main parts to include in, your, in any answer is to give your opinion, um, to give reasons for your opinion, and to give an example or two. So without all three parts, you might be left feeling like the examiner might be left wanting more or it might not feel like a well-rounded answer mm -hmm. but we're going to give you um, some hints and tips about each of those steps and some extras as well okay so another question we get asked a lot is what if i need to think about my answer so basically i need time to think about what yeah. i want to say yeah of course like anyone yeah a native speakers non-native yes. speakers if you're asked a difficult question yes sometimes you just need a moment to let your brain catch up and, and have a think. So um, rather than sitting in silence, panicking, <laughs> or looking at the floor, there are some phrases that you can use that I would use, that SJ would use in mm -hmm. everyday conversations. Yes. And remember, in the speaking test, this is an opportunity for you to show your um, your English language. So this is also an opportunity to show that you can... Um, you can use language naturally and that you can use um, functional language. So you could say something like, oh, that's a very interesting idea hmm. or that's uh, a difficult question, something I haven't really thought about before, but I believe that. And so you've bought yourself that all important few seconds so that your, your brain is very busy in the background getting an idea together. Okay, so we've got um, a few phrases for you. Here we are. That could help. Oops, wrong, wrong one. one. <laughs> okay. 
So that's an interesting or difficult question. I don't know much about the issue, issue, but or the topic or you know the subject. You know, lots of different. Uh, think of synonyms to you know to to use to about the same thing. Um, I've never really thought about it before, but. Yeah, you can't. You don't have the option to ask for a different question. So you're going to have to say, you know, you might want to say, I've never really thought about it before. Mm. I know that a lot of people think that you could always give the general opinion of people in general if you don't yes. want to commit to your own opinion. Yes. But you will need to justify it, give examples, all of those things, just like in an essay you mm. have to do. Right, so. Oh, another point to make, yeah. sorry, is don't use all of those phrases all of the time for every question, or will very quickly sound unnatural. Ah. Uh, so another question we get a lot is, what if I don't have anything to say about the topic? Okay, so we were just talking about that just mm. a little bit. So you could choose to give um, the opinion of people. You could say people where I come from or in my hometown or in my community a lot of people think if you don't want to give your own opinion although I I, I think personally mm -hmm. giving your own opinion is can be stronger sometimes but that's that's not an IELTS opinion that's my personal opinion um, you might want to give a controversial opinion okay. so you might want to say you, your opinion might be unpopular or you might think, oh goodness, the examiner is not going to have the same opinion as me. What's the right answer? There is no right answer in an opinion. You have to, you you can hold any opinion you want, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to justify it. And we do have a way in English of giving an opinion that we expect the listener to find controversial. So we'll say, to be honest or to be frank, when we are about to give an opinion that we think is not the general opinion of the room. It's not going to be a popular opinion. It's not going to be a popular opinion. We know that we're about to say something that may not be taken well. Yeah. Right. So here are the phrases that we talked about on giving an opinion. So I think, I feel, I believe, personally speaking, in my view, uh, it seems to me that and. And then when we come to, when we're about to say something that we think it might be controversial, we can say, to be frank, to be perfectly honest. Quite often we say to be brutally honest as well. Yeah. Um, so those are things that, I think you mentioned that these are signposts. Yes. Signposts. And so they so sort of help the examiner know what's coming. Yeah. Or help another speaker know what's coming. And it's important if you want a high band score to use this kind of language as well, to signpost where you're going, because mm. it is... a does show that you have a higher level of English. Um, another hint or tip that's really useful is mm -hmm. listen very carefully to the question mm -hmm. and use the grammar from the question as you would in any situation. Use the grammar from the question um, to inform how you're going to answer. So if it's a compare and contrast question, are you comparing one? Have you been asked to compare the past with the present, for example? Or are they asking you about a hypothetical situation? So would you need to use conditional phrases? Um, are they asking you to predict, in which case you're going to have to use the language of the future? So there are different question types. And if you listen carefully to the question that the examiner is asking you, that will often give you really huge clues as to the kind of grammar you ought to be including in your answer. OK, so you've got the topic, you've got the grammar, got the vocabulary, you've got your um, signposting, your cohesive devices. All of these things are coming together to give you a really good answer. Someone's actually put a comment on here, which I think is actually quite interesting. Uh, mm. Can we use to the best of my knowledge? Yes, of course. That's an excellent phrase to mm. bear in mind. Thank you very much, Abhishek Young Kunwa. I'm, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, yes to the best of my knowledge, it's also a very good um, sentence starter, topic starter. All right, so on to the next thing, which is, um, okay, so we were talking about um, what if we don't know anything about the topic? This is how you can express an opinion. How can I make my answer longer? 
So yeah, how do I expand on that? Mm. So we already said so you've got to explain why you hold the opinion that you hold. Mm. So this is very straightforward. You, because is the most natural thing yeah. that we we say. I yeah. think X because Y. Um, but to give us variety, here are a few other phrases that yep. we might like to use. And here they are. So the reason I think this is, and one reason for this is, I think this has happened because um, those are good um, phrases to use. Yeah, just yeah. standard phrases. But if you can get them in, it buys you a bit of time. Mm. It signposts the examiner. It shows good functional language. And it expands your answer and, and makes it more natural. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So um, let's move on to our next question. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I keep <laughs> not touching used the, to mic. the microphone. No, no. So you might have noticed that we now have microphones on our, because we were thinking we would need to make things clearer. So it'd be good to get any feedback if it's not clearer. Um, so, right. So do I have to talk about myself? That's another question we get a lot. Well, um, you, no, not necessarily, but you do have to, it does help if you give examples. So a lot of my students worry that they don't want to um, patronize the examiner or to explain things that they think, well, the, the examiner is, is a, a clever person who's well-educated and they must know all of this already. So I can't tell them this stuff is too, um, it's too simple, it's too obvious. Forget all of that. You're there to show your English. And the way you can best show your English is by explaining fully. So don't worry about telling the examiner something they already know. They don't mind about that. They're listening to your ability to use English well and to explain your reasons for something. So giving examples from your own life, from the news, is brilliant and if you don't have a specific example you can make one up hmm. you can say oh um, scientific research has recently discovered that it is better for people to keep pets than to go and visit animals in the zoo it doesn't have to be a true fact but so long as you present it using the correct language then you'll get all the marks for using the right language and um, the examiner is not worried about the truth or accuracy. Times, or accuracy. Yeah. So if you can remember, you have an idea, but you mm. can't remember exactly where you read about it or what that report was or which newspaper you were thinking of or yes. where you were. Just you can um, elaborate. <laughs> OK. Yeah. OK. So here's what we were talking about, which is how to give examples and mm. using phrases on how to introduce an example. Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, take X, for example, a good example of this is, you know, these are quite useful phrases for signposting what you want to say. All right. Now, don't worry if you've only just joined us and yep. that you've missed a lot of the slides. We're going to be putting them up later on um, after the session in an album. So you can review them again later on. Right. So you've expanded on your answer. Mm -hmm. uh, so what else can you add? You could add um, an alternative point of view at this point. You could say using those, um, to get, using your cohesive devices to show contrast, you could say, however, on the other hand, um, alternatively. Mm -hmm. So you could give other people's opinions. You could say, I believe, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, a lot of people think, da, 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 da and give an alternate opinion. This is a way of showing that you know, of expanding your answer, of filling it out, of showing variety, of showing an understanding of a situation, okay? Okay, so here's what we talked about, which is introducing a different point of view or how to introduce different points of view. So again, these are very useful phrases for when you're about to introduce a different point of view. Yep. So on the other hand, then again, however, alternatively. Mm. And it shows the person you're speaking to in the exam or just, you know, wherever, mm -hmm. that you do know <laughs> that you're giving um, a different point of view mm -hmm. and you haven't just got confused and you haven't just gone off on a random tangent, but that you are linking it all back together. It's the important thing is that you keep it all linked back together, keep it all on task. Okay. Right. 
Okay, so where are we at now? Where are we at? Turn the page. Okay. Oh, ah, this is an excellent one. So we're here, we get asked this question all the time. So because we get asked this question all the time, I'm just going to put it on screen right now. So can I ask the examiner to explain something I don't understand? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. In part three, you can. Yes. And um, you can use it to your advantage. If you don't understand something, don't panic. Just use some helpful phrases to get you out of a sticky situation. So at this point, you have some different options. So perhaps if we can if we can show the next slide mm -hmm. so we can talk, I'll talk through the phrases that we've got. So I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? This is a very, very natural and common way to ask someone to say something again. So rather than what I don't understand, say again, that would not be very polite. But perfectly polite and perfectly reasonable is to say, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Or just, could you repeat that, please? Remember, in English, we are extremely polite. <laughs> Lots of pleases and thank yous and I'm sorry's. Absolutely. You really, you can't say please too many times. Okay. Um, so that first one there is if you haven't, if you have missed the question and you just want it to be repeated again, you can ask the examiner to repeat the question. Um, the next one, sorry, I'm not sure what mm means. You can ask the examiner, you can say that and the examiner will be able to give it to you in other words or an explanation to help you to understand that one thing that you've missed. Um, could you say that in other words? So asking, yeah. uh, asking someone to repeat the question, but in a different way so that you might be able to understand it better. Mm. And then the last two are for checking. So when you think you've understood, you're pretty sure you have, but you just not... 100% and you want a little bit, you want reassurance that you've got the, you've understood what's being asked of you. So we've got two useful phrases there. Mm -hmm. Am I right in thinking you mean X? Uh, are you asking whether? Okay. Yeah. So again, these slides are going to be up on, on our page for mm. you to review and have a look at uh, after this session. And don't worry, I, I, I can see that we've got lots of questions coming up. Um, we will address them after we've done our session. Um, Pardon, I didn't quite catch that. That's yes. very nice, Emmy. I like it. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure what you didn't catch, so I can't repeat it. But it's a perfect <laughs> use of English. Well done. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now we go on to the fun bit, I guess. Okay. Are we are we on to the fun bit where we I start? Think we are. Ah, this so is the fun we're bit. going to um, well we're basically we're going to put SJ to the test now. <laughs> okay. So this is the situation. Imagine we've had a part two where the topic was a present you've received. Talk about um, when you received it, who you received it from, why it was important to you. Okay, and our follow-up is going to be, part three is going to be linked by theme. It's not going to be questions about the presentation you've just given. It's going to be questions on a related theme that's more abstract. So the question we're going to use today for SJ and see if she can manage it is, um, what sort of aid do governments, oh, hold on a minute, we've got a spelling error. We've got a word order error. What sort of aid do governments oh. give to other countries? Please ignore the two <laughs> in that question. I don't know how that has gone through all of our spell checking and various people have looked at these slides. Um, mm. But that's the question we're going to use. So what sort of aid do governments give to other countries? Okay. Oh, hold so on, we, one, moment. one moment. We're going to let uh, SJ answer that question for us. Okay. And then what Emma is going to do is she's going to highlight on the screen some of the keywords that we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try and use that structure that yeah. she's given us. Okay. So the question is, what sort of aid do governments give to other countries? Well, um, that is a very interesting question. Uh, it's something that I 
haven't really thought about quite a lot. Um, but I imagine that the kind of aid that a lot of governments give to other countries would be financial aid. Um, I think that they also give humanitarian aid. Um, they also give expertise, for example, if a if one country had um, problems with earthquakes, another government could offer their earthquake specialists to help with that and give advice. Um, there have been situations lately where there are lots there have been lots of natural disasters, and various governments have pitched in, sending in experts as well as humanitarian aid, so just help with helping people get out of the, the disaster that they're in. Um, I think that um, governments give aid because it's not only helpful to the government themselves, but I also think that you know, it helps with developing relationships between various governments. Mm. And then, and if, if, if governments help each other, I think that that works towards a more a much more peaceful more cooperative global stage as it were okay thank you we could add something on the other hand but in this instance i don't know what we might say of the alternative opinion so yes. on the other hand i suppose you could say on the other hand not all governments are in a position to be able to financially help another country yes. depends on the economic um the uh gross economic figures for each country that you're talking about for example um so often it will be a country will help with the expertise or the things that that country is strong in so it's not always going to be viable mm -hmm. for every country to help each other I on the other hand i guess one way of, of the way I've answered as well is because of the actual question that mm. was being asked. It asked what sort of aid do governments give to other countries? It wasn't really asking me for an opinion. Mm. Whereas there was a follow-up question to that, which yeah. was, what do you think motivates governments to give aid to other countries? Now, if we just oh. get, hit that one. So if you hit the... Yeah, there we go. There. So if um, we hide that. that. There we right. go. So, Carry on, sorry. So as you can see in the second question, what do you think motivates governments to give aid to other countries? That kind of question would open up mm. things like, you know, on the other hand, for example, I, I did give an example. Yes, you I did. did you did. You I used did give all an example. Of the phrases. Um, so so that, that sort of question, what do you think? I think mm -hmm. that's something to listen out for, to yeah. watch out for, and that will kind of help you consider, well, I can actually give a, a different opinion to the one that is popular. Um, so, okay. So what do we think? What was, how, what was, what do you think um, my answer to the question was? I think we need to close the screen. Okay. <laughs> to, uh, so I can see back. a lot of people, um, we, a lot of people are giving some ideas. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's shall we show this one for example yes so we a lot of you are giving us ideas there's another one here from rebecca i agree with you this question is very difficult i agree it is we did choose an especially difficult, <laughs> difficult question one. yes we did we didn't want to give everyone a false sense of comfort because <laughs> very difficult questions can come up okay more easier questions than this do come up as well but we have no idea of knowing what will come up in the, your exam. The questions that we've we've just um, talked about are actually from this book, which is, uh, well, the second part of this book, which is the official IELTS practice materials, which you can get from the IELTS website, which our moderator, Liz, will probably put the link up to short, shortly. Uh, yes, I can see that, yes, there are lots of comments there about how to make what do you know some ideas yeah, some so ideas of about what, why governments give aid to yeah, each other yeah but again it wasn't a why question it was a what question i guess that's one of the things that we could oh no about. i don't think that no. i think that is perfectly okay to right. develop an answer into a why because question. especially in this part three of the discussion 
it's there for you to develop. So you can say what sort of aid governments give, so financial aid, um, they might give support in a crisis um, of people of expertise, and then you can go on to say why they give this. So what's yeah. the interest? So you, um, you, the in part three, whilst the examiner has got the questions, they won't necessarily have to ask all of them. So if just if you are talking and giving, uh, having an interesting discussion, then it will just it can just, we'll carry, just carry on. on. So it's quite a natural part of the I was actually, process. I was actually half waiting for you to ask me a question yeah. because, <laughs> because I was pausing. Um, but I think that was for me to sort of manage that time. So, you know, knowing that I I need to keep talking. Mm. So if you think that you can see the connection between your writing, the kind of language you're using in writing, and the kind of language that you might use in the speaking part three, you could give us a thumbs up. That would be great so that we can see that it's making sense <laughs> to you. Excellent. All right. Um, so that's the end of our presentation, I believe, uh, unless we want to talk more a about... Very nice comment Ooh. there. Sorry. Gosh. To establish strong bilateral, bilateral relationships. That's an excellent comment. And I would hope that you would go on to explain what that means. Yes. And what the implications are for both sides of the relationship and um, how that can benefit um, the, the state of the world as yes. well for peacekeeping. Global relations. Global relations. Yes. Excellent, excellent stuff. We're doing so well. Yes. Um, is it okay to mention a certain country in this question? That's quite an interesting oh, one. Of course. Yes, of course, because when you're giving examples, you can give specific examples. So you can start broad and bring it back in and say, you know, my country or X country gave assistance in this way, that way, the other way, and the reason for that and what the outcomes of that were and how that has helped, not helped, the implications of it over time. Excellent. Does correcting our grammar while we speak reduce the score? Oh, that question's been asked a few times, um, Daniela. Yes, yes. Uh, no, it won't. No, no, it will improve your score <laughs> rather than keeping bad grammar. Definitely, if you notice you've made a mistake, correct yourself, it's totally natural. Um, and uh, native speakers do it all the time as well. So you won't lose marks. You need to balance fluency um, with accuracy. So you can't speak so slowly and so painstakingly that you'll never make a mistake because that then you lose you'll lose marks for fluency. At the same time, if you're incredibly fluent, but not a single sentence that you say is grammatically correct, you'll lose marks for accuracy. So it's that it's finding that balance and, and finding a natural way to speak. But you'll notice if you watch new interviews in the, on Newsnight or something like that, I don't know, on, on news programs, that people in all languages will correct themselves and will stop and go back and say, what I meant to say is, or in other words, or you know, they will not finish every sentence perfectly. But that's just a natural way of speaking. I can see that we're getting loads of comments. A lot of you are commenting with what you would actually say. Uh, and they're really, really good things to say. Mm. Um, I recommend that you will have a look through the comments yeah. later um, and note down some of the ideas people are coming up, coming up with. Yeah, they're really good ideas. That, if that question, that type of question were yeah. to come up in your writing test, or that topic were to come up in your speaking test, or just for your own vocabulary development, there are some fantastic resources coming up there. So we've just swiftly gone into the Q&A session, so we're mm -hmm. going to take some questions now. Um, I want to say out front that we are not going to answer any questions about improving your band score. Mm. Um, this is really important because Improving band scores is quite a personal thing, and Emma can sort of explain that much better than I can. I mean, yeah, so it's it's going to be very the reason why you get a certain band score is uh, about the whole the whole um, the test that you do. So it could be any number of things that you need to work on, and without speaking to each of you individually, it'd be very difficult to analyze where you're falling short. So is it grammar, is it accuracy, is it fluency, is it um, the, the um, what we call L1 interference? So is it the um, accent? Whilst we always say accent's not 
important. You don't need to sound British or American. You do need to be understood. So if um, pronunciation can be a problem, if it means the, the examiner can't actually understand what you're saying, um, it could be a lack of vocabulary range. It could be a lack of grammatical range. So there's so many things that yeah. it could be. It's impossible for us to say. Okay. So Emma did address something uh, which has come up time and time again, which is, does accent matter? And no, it doesn't matter. You just need to be understood. Um, so on to the questions. Okay, that, I think that one's a good one. So can we change the question if we don't have anything to say? No, you're going to have to say, you're going to have to try and answer the question. So use some of the strategies. So I haven't thought about this before um, it's a very difficult question but I imagine that for some people it might be and, and then give yeah x and you're going to have to come up with something because part of the um, part of what the you're being tested on is your ability to deal with a difficult situation in English so part of that is how to get around that situation okay How about there's one there that's uh, from now as if and what if I stammer? Yes, I saw that. What if I stammer? Okay. There, I mean, if you stammer, you stammer. That's not that's not going to make a difference to your score. You can't help stammering. It's you just have to try your best. Um, and you, if you really, if it seems like, you, or um, rather, if you have any additional needs that you need to to raise those with the um, the exam centre because they there are things that can be done to help people. So there are um, different um, different strategies that can be taken. There's a whole section on the website of how you can be helped if you have additional needs, if you have learning needs or physical needs. Um, you might need to have the exam paper in Braille or you might need to have um, a special setup for your, for the listening exam, the speaking exam. Okay, so speak to your local test centre if you think that you need some additional support support in taking the exam. But IELTS does pride itself on being able to accommodate everyone. Okay, here's a very interesting question. It's quite a long one. It's about the actual questions. So do you mind if I just go and pull that up? No, it's okay. So, so um, Andrea. Andrea Teresa. Basically, in my experience, um, if you have a lot to say, you might get one or two questions. And if you have a bit less to say, because you may be the first or one of the questions you just really don't have much to say on, then the examiner will ask a few more questions. I think that the three or four questions are there so that the um, examiner has the the opportunity to ask more questions and keep you talking, the candidate talking. But if you're going strong, they're not going to, you know, there's not a time limit. Okay. So, so the question that we answered earlier on, so under that question, if I just pull up the slide again, mm. um, so under that, there were two questions under that. So what sort of aid? And then that was, so if I hadn't carried on talking, I might have been asked. Actually. No? No, no. actually. Okay. That's on that wrong. speaking test, those were questions five and six. Ah, okay. There were four questions before that. They, ah. We just chose the hardest ones. Right, okay. Um, but there were some other questions before that. About uh, we can show them. We, we can, can show, show a couple that. of the other ones. And you'll go, oh, those are easier. <laughs> but yeah. I was being mean to SJ oh, and, and gave her the hardest Emma. questions. <laughs> what can uh, I say? You know, it's good this, also, this would have been easier for me because it's quite personal, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so for someone like me, you know, who was closer to more personal things, that would have been easier for me. So the international gift giving, it was actually quite hard. Mm. Okay. So. Do you agree that speaking can be considered the easiest part of the IELTS? That absolutely depends on the individual. I have students who love the speaking test and hate the writing. Yes. Others who find the listening the easiest part, others who find the reading the easiest part. It's very, very individual. And we all have our own strengths and weaknesses. So um, for, yeah. for one person it's speaking, for one person it's writing, another it's reading. So yeah. it, you can't say any part is easier than another. That's absolutely true. 
Um, a student is asking if IELTS is different set per region. Um, no, it's the same questions, the same, the examiners are all trained following the exact same training and all of, it's all standardized and comes out of the same place. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can we use quotes in speaking? I think when you say quotes, I think you mean other people's opinions. So for example, um, you could, is that what you mean? Uh, Nanu? Um, I guess when you say quotes, I think you mean other people's opinions. And I think we've established that we could. You could, if you, yeah. I mean, if it was appropriate and not too long, don't answer the whole question in someone else's words. But, this is true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With repeating the same idioms in entire speaking section. No, as always, don't overuse idioms. Try to avoid them unless you know you're absolutely using them correctly. You won't get extra marks for using an idiom wrongly. <laughs> okay, so be very wary of using idioms. Certainly don't overuse them. Would you get marks deducted for using an idiom incorrectly? Well, it might hinder understanding. Ah. And if it hinders understanding and it stops the cohesive flow of what you're saying, then it would not necessarily deducted for using an idiom wrongly, but it, the impact on the things you are being marked on right. okay. might, lower, might lower bring score. those scores down. In other words, it could do more harm than good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. What have we got? How many marks is necessary to pass IELTS? We can't answer that. <laughs> Film or an actor from my country, can I speak instead about Western film or actors? I'm a big fan of Hollywood. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, why not? Just start by saying, oh, um, whilst there are lots of fine actors in my country, I'm not a big fan of the um, of films from around here. I much prefer Hollywood films. So I instead am going to speak about an actor from... Um, wherever America America the UK Canada whatever yeah. yeah yeah again it's you're not being you're not going to lose marks on that because they're going yeah. to be marking you on your English it's not like you say I don't like films so I'm going to talk about swimming pools that would be inappropriate but to just choose an actor from a different country is fine um oh gosh can that's... we make a lot of hand gestures I just saw one where down here, Margarita, nice name. <laughs> Can we make a look? You probably noticed that I've been doing this all the time that I'm speaking. It doesn't matter, one way or the other. Actually, okay. that brings me to a question that's come up in the previous sessions, and I've seen a few things here about body language. And how is, you know, I know the IELTS test is about language, but we do sometimes talk about, you know, using hand gestures and body language. Like the question was, does body language count towards your marks? It doesn't. There isn't a specific section that the examiner is marking mm. you on for body language. But mm. like with anything like a job interview or anything like that, if you can have positive eye contact and good body language and come across confidently, then you'll probably perform better. better. And that in itself may bring your marks up because it might you might present a better yes. exam. But there isn't a section of the, what the examiner is marking mm -hmm. for body language. But in it's just one of those things about meeting people, using good, positive body language is always going to be helpful. Um, I can see there are questions about bands. We can't. No, I'm afraid we can't actually answer no. questions on band scores. Okay, how are we doing for time? Ooh, <laughs> we probably need to wrap things yes, up. Yes, we do. Soon. Okay, we'll take two more questions okay. and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, okay, there's still lots of comments coming in about the gift giving thing. Yeah. All right, I'm going to skip up. Okay, let's have a look at Jagrat Dave there. 
After the last discussion question, can we say, nice to meet you and thank you for your time? Well, the examiner will indicate that the test is over. So don't worry, you, you will know that it's finished and they will thank you for your time. And yes, of course, just uh, thank you. It was lovely to meet you today and thank you very much for your time. Yeah, of course. Um, it probably isn't going to be marked one way no. or the other. <laughs> but it's polite yeah, but it's and it, polite. Is, it makes everyone's day better. Uh, what will happen if I didn't use any idioms? Nothing. Nothing. I don't think I've used any idioms today. We haven't used any idioms today. No. Well, I've, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. <laughs> for us, uh, I guess. But um, nothing. If you don't use, you know, there's not a magic um, tick box. They used idioms, therefore they must get a high band score. That doesn't exist. Okay. So don't worry about using idioms. Is it necessary to make the answer longer? No. I mean, you need to give a full answer. I get, so I, I guess no. Like, do you know, do you, do you think, um, so for okay, example, so, what do you think motivates governments to give aid to other countries? Um, lots of things. That's not going to be long enough. No. I mean, you have to give a longer answer in that, insofar as you have to expand, explain why, mm. and give examples. That will give you a much better chance of getting a, a, a better score because quite simply, you'll be using more English. So we're right. trying to give you strategies to use more varied English. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these slides very, very quickly now. Okay. So this is the part of the answer. Oh, Let's hide this hide. one. Yep. All right, so this part of the test focuses on your ability to express and justify opinions, to analyze, discuss, and speculate about issues. And then we went on to give you a rough structure on how to develop your answer. Mm -hmm. So you give your opinion, give a reason, give an example. Um, here are some phrases on how to buy yourself some thinking yeah. time. So that's an interesting question. I don't know much about the issue, but I've never really thought about it. Or in my case, I actually said, I have actually thought about it quite a lot, but not in such great detail. Um, give an opinion. I think, I feel, I believe, personally speaking. So these are all um, phrases that you can use to, to let the examiner know that you are about to say something or what you're going to say. Explain why, so here are your reasons. These are, again, very useful phrases. Give examples, again, this is these are phrases that you can use to start giving your examples. Uh, and then here are some phrases on how to introduce different points of view. This is not an essential part. I mean, this is yeah. like an extra, yeah. an added bit. And yeah, that is if, you know, if again, you listen to. listen to the, the question um, quite carefully. If they're asking for an opinion, then this is an opportunity to give an alternative opinion. And finally, we did ask the question, can we ask the examiner to explain something that you don't understand? The answer is yes, yes. And here are some ways on how you can ask for help. I'm sorry, can you repeat that phrase? Again, remember in English, we are very polite. There's a lot of please, there's a lot of sorry, could you? You know, it's always all of that. And also, don't forget, you can also clarify mm -hmm. a, uh, a question that you're not really sure about. So am I right in thinking that you mean this? And um, and then these are the questions that we talked about. And um, that's it, really. So I think that, I don't know if we've got any more. Where's that? the last ones? We've missed the last ones. Um, Let's have a little last, very last question. Just to, to set your mind at ease. What if I missed answering one of the requirements given in the question? Um, don't worry, because there'll be more questions, okay? So just, it's it's a more of a, it's a starting point for a discussion, okay? So it's not, whilst there is crossover with writing part two, it's not as strict in that sense. Okay, so just, all we've done today, this is not the absolutely the perfect answer you have to give. That's It's just one approach, okay? It's just to help you to give a more extended, more rounded, more developed answer. Yeah. So if you don't use this strategy, it's fine. That's fine. Yeah. This is just one way that I help my students yes. to get used to giving longer, more detailed answers. That's all it is. Okay, well, good luck to everybody who's taking the test. 
um, this week or very soon or whenever. Um, we know it's hard and yep. that's why we're here um, to help. Um, remember, if you've missed any of this, it's going to be on our Facebook page, so you can watch it again later on. And we'll also be posting our slides later on in the album, so you can have a look at them again. Now, remember, you know, this is one way of dealing with it, as Emma said. So keep calm, be focused, you do fine, yep. be positive. Good luck. And smile, smile at the examiner. <laughs> okay, if you've got your test this coming weekend, good luck this coming week. If not, we'll see you again soon. Definitely. So watch the space for more sessions with us. All right, have a good rest of the day or evening. Bye. Bye.